Okay. My screen says got it. So you just click on got it. And that's it. Okay. And um, I guess we can get going. Um, I'm sure that there'll be nice, great things to talk about. And um, I'm going to ask, um, let's see. I'm going to ask our prayer coordinator, Sister Eda, would you like to pray for us in order to open our meeting tonight? Of course. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this weekend. It's a family weekend, and we are happy that we are here gathered together as family, mm. or church family, even though we may not all be blood family, but we are a family in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the pools, for visiting us and bringing us new insights mm. into the family situation and how we may function successfully mm. with our families. We thank you for all those who are participating, and we hope that others will join as we go along. And we pray that this beginning for the weekend will be the start of something wonderful and beneficial to us. So we ask you to bless us now as we begin our discussions, and we ask that you be our guide and our leader and counselor mm -hmm. in all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Um, Elizabeth Orlando will be okay. I know that tomorrow in the services in both churches, uh, I will do a little bit of uh, just an introduction, background information on the presenters. Would it be okay if I do the same tonight? Sure, up to you. Okay, all right. I found some really juicy information. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> only kidding. But... Um, um, so, um, Orlando and Elizabeth Pule, of course, they're pastors of the Ontario Conference and are known widely for their mutual passion and leadership in the area of family life ministry. Their focus, of course, is on marriage, education, and training uh, may likely be traced back to their own personal experiences. Elizabeth has always called Toronto home while Orlando was born and raised in New Zealand. Clearly, their love story spans thousands of miles and is only the beginning of why they prioritize family and marriage relationships in their ministry. They believe in the benefits of community, marriage, mm -hmm. mentoring, and enjoy journeying with families. Orlando and Elizabeth both hold graduate degrees in theology. Uh, Orlando and Elizabeth uh, have both had the privilege of serving as pastors in local churches, um, including one where I was a member. Uh, and they currently serve as co-directors of family ministries, men, women, and singles at the Ontario Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Elizabeth and Orlando live in Oshawa and are blessed with three energetic determined boys, Gabriel, Isaiah, and Samuel. And so uh, I thank you for um, allowing us to have this time with you. And we thank you so much. And, um, and at this time, we'll just let you go to it. So welcome. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the prayers. Uh, we want to thank uh, Pastor uh, Rui and his family, uh, and also the church families of St. Catharines and also Niagara for allowing us to be with you this week. And we look forward to seeing you all in person. Um, but, you know, it's great that we have this Zoom time here with each of you. And so as we go through today, tomorrow, we are talking about the family. There are certain topics that we want to dive into. Um, but today we're going to be talking about Sticky faith. That's right. Sticky faith. Uh, you know, how can we, oh, we have to show our slides. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so how can we build lasting faith and grow lasting faith in our families with our children? Mm -hmm. And so this is what we're going to be uh, diving into this evening. So my first question, and, and this is for <laughs> parents, guardians, grandparents, aunties, and uncles. Uh, I want you to think back to the little ones 
the teenagers and the adolescents in your life, mm-hmm. what is one thing, you know, your kids or your grandkids, nephews and nieces learned how to do without you formally teaching them? Yes. Think back. Think. Mm-hmm. And you can go ahead and write that in the chat. Mm. In the chat. Um, what is one thing that, you know, the young people in your life learn how to do without you formally teaching them? Hmm. Yeah. What about you? Uh, I would say um, sing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You just. I don't think anyone got any formal, formal training, training on just, singing. Just... It was just, you know, singing family functions, mm-hmm. singing for morning and evening devotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you were forced to sing in church. So that was kind of like your graduation, you know? Um, but yeah, no, no formal, you know, just you saw, you just did it. Open up your mouth and, and do it. Make a joyful noise. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think for us, for mm-hmm. me growing up, is how I I just started cooking. Okay. My parents never formally taught me. They never said, do this, do this. But I think just watching them mm. is how I learned how to cook. And then yeah. I just started cooking like at 10 years old. Just wow. cook, cook, cook. Wow. So I don't know if you, friends, if you want to put, you know, in the chat is one thing that maybe your kids or the young people in your life learn how to do without you formally teaching them. Mm. I mean, there are kids like age one and two who know how to use the iPad yes. or the tablet and they didn't go to school for that, right? They just nope. know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is, it's what's being caught, not necessarily taught. Mm-hmm. And so in this workshop, um, we're going to do four things. Oh, yeah, use yeah, technology. Yeah. That's yes. right, Melissa. Thank they you. just they just do it. Yeah, they, they just know how to you know, press, press the, the button buttons. and swipe, you know, all the pictures and all that. I don't know. It's just, yeah. I don't they know. Just, they just know how to do yeah. it. They yeah. know how to turn on the TV. <laughs> they know how to pick Disney Plus. They know how to do all of that stuff. They know the lyrics of the TikTok. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's amazing. <Scary. laughs> That's, That's true. Right. It's true. That is very true. <laughs> um, so for this workshop for today, uh, we are going to learn uh, and take a a look at why our young people leave the church. Um, There's so much discussion. There are a lot of statistics that are out there. And some of them may, you know, even surprise you when we go through them today. Another thing we're going to go through tonight is understanding how your children choose Jesus. What is the identity status paradigm, um, you know, that they are a part of when they choose um, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And what can we do as parents? What can we do as grandparents? Yes. What can we do as leaders to disciple our children? Then we're just going to have a Q&A, uh, you know, for, to end off tonight. That's perfect. So friends, um, there is a professor at Southern Adventist University named Alan Parker, and mm. he has been doing research on why young people leave the church. And yeah. He's been collecting data for a while and yeah, researching yeah. and he, for the last 10 years yeah he's been really researching this and he did uh, a survey mm-hmm. he surveyed 712 individuals hmm. uh, about how old they were you know why did they leave the church and so i want to show you this graph here this is a survey of former members um and as you see the chunk of people leaving our Adventist church are under the age of 35. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that big orange pie slice is 25 to 34. And then the green is 35 to 44. So there's like two generations of individuals that are no longer part of the Adventist church. I mean, we we, we usually group the generations. So Mm -hmm. we we are talking about millennials and we're also talking about uh, generation X. Generation, yes, right? Gen X, yeah, Gen Xers. So these are the two that, you know, the green and the orange, those are the two that are represented the most in this. That's right. Now, in your experience, you know, in your church or maybe in your family, does this hold true to you? When you look at your church, are these individuals not there? Or maybe your family, mm-hmm. you know, maybe your brother, or your sister, or like a nephew are no longer there. Maybe your kids are no longer there. Um, So we need to kind of investigate the reason why our young people are leaving and take a look at this slide. They asked them, why did you leave? Mm -hmm. And the two highest reasons, doctrinal disagreements and hypocrisy of church members. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's a big deal. Yeah. 
Um, and there's something about the way millennials and Gen X individuals think. Hmm. This matters to them, how we treat people, yeah. how we're treated, and what we say about important things that are happening in the mm -hmm. world. Or how mm -hmm. do our doctrines align with what's happening mm -hmm. in the world? Yeah, and we always look at, you know, the top three. So even if we go back, you know, down a little bit more, we do see felt judged, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, that's, and that's kind of a big thing yeah. uh, as well, you know, as we look at it in terms of the statistics. Um, you know, according to Alan Parker's research, there are these growing gaps mm -hmm. between the church and our young adults. And he mentions four. And the first one is a rationality gap. Yeah. So they just don't understand how we can say God is important and how much we love him, yet they don't experience God yeah. in our churches. Yeah, yeah. Um, another one is the authenticity gap. Yes. Um, and this is when we say we love God, we love the people around us in our communities, yet a lot of the things that we do in terms of programming um, and even the events or even the focus is always within the four walls of our churches. And so that's what, you know, this is talking about the authenticity when we are talking about these things, yet it never seems to go beyond the four walls. Right. Uh, the third gap is the compassion gap. Mm. These individuals shared that they, they don't feel cared for. So they left. Yeah. Uh, there's church trauma. There's church burnout. Uh, there's there is no love for you know marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to share some of the uh, comments that came on this survey. They said, ever since I left the church twelve years ago, not a single person has reached out and invited me back. Hmm. I called the pastor years ago and asked him to pull my membership, and all he said was, "Okay." The last time I went to church, I had my tent, my then small child with me and the lady in the pew behind me asked me to please leave because my child was distracting her from the sermon. Hmm. I was already feeling not welcome and that was the last straw that broke me. I cried all the way home and have never been back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've heard some of these stories, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This yeah, is not yeah. new information. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so the question was posed, you know, what would bring you back? Mm -hmm. And look at what came mm -hmm. in their answers. Mm -hmm. Church cared about social, you know, issues that happen, you know, within um, our communities and being able to do something about it um, if people were less proud. Wow. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are really interesting reasons why millennials and Gen X these are the reasons why they would come back. Mm -hmm. This speaks volumes about our church and yeah. what's happening in our communities. Um, uh, one of the survey uh, individuals wrote, my reasons to lead had nothing to do with God mm. and everything to do with institutionalized racism and sexism and the members protecting people in power at the expense of the church youth. Mm. Yeah. You know, we, we need to we need to really look at these things mm -hmm. that young people are saying. Mm -hmm. um, the next gap is the engagement yeah. gap. Now, uh, Barna did some research and it says this. One of the strengths of the Adventist church churches is that they have many opportunities. And this is the plus. We have many opportunities for their children and youth to be involved. Um, so, you know, we can think about a lot of things even in our churches, Pathfinders, Adventures, youth groups, um, mission trips, right? Uh, but there is a difficult transition from child to adult. Don't miss this. We have a lot of things for our children, but when it comes to them being adults, it seems like we have fewer opportunities at the says. And so as one person in our post-college discussion group said, if you aren't a child and don't have a child, there's nothing for you. Now, you know, there's a lot of things that we, you know, as, as we're going through this, we have to start thinking about our places, our spaces of worship, our church. What are we doing? And even in this pandemic moment, it was it was something that everyone transitioned to. First of all, it was the church service. Mm -hmm. Second, it was, hey, let's do something for the kids. But what about the teens and the young adults? Yeah. And, you know, they were always 
um, the last, you know, to, to be looked at. And, and so, you know, this is spot on. So I'm going to share another comment from one of the survey takers. They said, we just don't seem to care. The church in the area I lived has nothing from my generation. Mm. If you are a child or a senior, there are programs for you, but there is nothing in between. Nothing in between Jesus loves me and bringing in the sheaves. Mm. I went through a divorce. I lost my home in a fire. Then a few years later, my name was taken off the books because I hadn't contacted the local church. No attempt was made to find me or see if I could use some help or prayer. In our area, Adventism is very much catch and release. Mm -hmm. So friends, like what can we do to grow our kids to have sticky faith? Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is take a look at how young people Mm -hmm. make the decision Mm -hmm. uh, to stay or leave our church. And And, and, before we get there, even though the statistics point to something that's very bleak, there's hope. Mm-hmm. You know, and there, and this is where you know we're we're talking. What we're talking about here is that we can make a difference as a church. Right now, we can make this difference. Uh, and so, as we go through this, think about what this looks like for you know your church community and also your families as well. Those with younger children. Okay, so let's jump into this, uh, and we're gonna just we're not gonna go deep into the mm-hmm. identity stare, status paradigm by James Marcia, but. You've got achievement, moratorium, foreclosure, and then diffusion. Mm -hmm. And we're going to use the example of putting on clothes. Mm -hmm. So when our kids are young, we pick out their clothes for them. We say, wear the red pants and the black shirt, and they just put it on usually, right? (laughs) But there comes a time when they start to make these choices on their own. Yes. Now, depending on, you know, your culture and your family of origin, If I put on like a whack outfit, my mother would say something to me Mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in other homes, maybe it was no big deal. If you were wearing an an orange shirt and green pants, maybe that was okay. So at some point we pick our own clothes Mm -hmm. and this is the same as our faith. Mm -hmm. You know, our kids come to church because we bring them. We say, get up, put this on, have a breakfast, let's go. Mm. But there comes a time, yep. an age, when they need to make that choice for themselves. Yes. And as they exercise these different statuses, moratorium, foreclosure, diffusion, achievement, they will explore hmm. if faith in Jesus is something that's important to them. Are they curious about Jesus? Hmm. You know, do they have questions? And is there enough? differentiation between young adult, child, and the parents Mm -hmm. for them to take ownership of the church that they want to attend, of the spiritual curriculum that they want to explore, Mm. and how attached they are to these choices. Yes. I mean, for some of us, Mm -hmm. we've been in the same church for, you know, maybe our whole lives, Mm -hmm. but how do we uh, navigate when our child says, you know, I don't want to go to this church anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to go to this church because all my friends are there. Mm -hmm. Are we okay with that? Are we going to let them do that? Um, And our kids will go through these processes as they choose who they maybe want to date, who they want to marry, what their career is, Mm -hmm. uh, their sexuality. They will have to explore all of these things. And sometimes they will repeat the statuses Mm -hmm. when their minds change. And so this is not a a sequential process. Mm -hmm. They might jump from place to place and they might do it over and over again. Mm. So, you know, now that we kind of understand that, let's talk about what influences our kids as they make these choices. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, you know, the power of influence. Mm. So uh, power of influence, um, and there may be others that uh, you know of, go ahead and put those in the chat. But here we have friends, Um, very important. Um, You think back to when you were younger, your friends was everything. Um, When I think about my own spiritual journey growing up, we went to church and church was all about hanging out with our friends. Uh, and social media, you know, there's a power of influence in that. Um, the teachers and the adult mentors, this is very important 
we could all remember a teacher that really took notice of us, helped us to grow in academics, but more than that, they cared about us. Um, influences, celebrities, uh, church leaders and pastors. Um, we can think back to you know all the kids that are now adults and even marrying now um, from when we were their pastors. Um, and even parents, these are the most influential Yes. Um, within, number you know, one. number one that's in there. So there's a lot of different influences that they are getting from a lot of different spaces mm -hmm. as they continue to grow. So as they're going through, you know, their identity status mm -hmm. paradigm, these are the, the, the power of influences that are kind of shaping their choices. But remember, it's positive and negative influence. Yes, yes, yes. We can all remember an amazing teacher that poured into mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. But we can also remember the teacher that maybe did not. Yes. Or, you know, the adult that said something mm -hmm. negative or unkind. We remember these things. Yes, yes. Um, and I think if we understand the gravity of how much influence you as church leaders, mm -hmm. as parents, yeah. as elders in the church have on our young people, mm -hmm. you know, we just have to be careful with our words yes. and our yeah. actions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Beulah. Uh, I will take them to the places and churches where they want to go, where they feel comfortable, where they're building those relationships and those networks. And we've all heard the saying where it takes a village to raise a child. All of these things here, friends, teachers, adults, influences, uh, church leaders, parents, you, everyone works together. Everyone does some sort of piece to be able to grow our children and to influence them. So it really does take a community collectively to grow our children uh, and uh, in the area of discipleship. Yes. Um, Fuller Youth Institute mm. did a study of 1,300 high school graduates and followed them. Yep for a couple of years and they talked about how to grow this sticky faith you know mm. what we can do to disciple our kids and the first thing they mentioned is intergenerational relationships yes very important and you know despite the different age groups in our churches um each young person is greatly benefited when surrounded by a team of five adults yeah. so that ratio the five to one mm -hmm. ratio is important what what so who are we talking about it could be aunties uncles teacher elder sabbath school teacher mm -hmm. pastor adults to children i mean you think about it if you had a child and they had a team of five grown-ups that love them like how awesome is that yeah, yeah. it's like having five parents <laughs> <laughs> um, there is such power and strength in intergenerational relationships. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's one of the ways that we can kind of grow that sticky faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when we talk about intergenerational, it's not just the adults who are pouring into the kids. This goes both ways. And so this also is for the kids to be able to pour into us. Yes. To have those have those relationships where you know what, we may not understand what TikTok is all about. We may not understand what um, some of these technology things, but, you know, teach we can you. learn. They'll teach, right? And Very it's not necessarily good. about teaching. It's about being in the same space and allowing them, giving them the idea that we value whatever yes. that they're doing, you know, and that allows for them to grow. So this intergenerational yes. has to be two ways. It's yes. not us you know, always coming down on them and pouring into them, we got to allow spaces for them to pour into us right. as well. And a great example of that is, you know, when we all jumped on this evening, Nancy had this really cool cartoon avatar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she said, we're like, oh, we like your avatar. She said, oh, it's one of my kids <laughs> did that. That's what it's about. Letting yeah. our kids be a part of our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, we share things, these intergenerational relationships. Yeah. The second thing is the whole mm -hmm. gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about it. Um, you know, growing up as an Adventist, I will be very honest with you. When my non-Adventist friends asked me what it meant, I told them all the things I didn't do. Uh, I don't go out on Friday. I don't eat pork. Um we don't wear jewelry. I told them all the things we didn't do, but I did not talk to them about Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, I was raised as an Adventist and it Mm -hmm. took me a really long time Mm -hmm. to develop a personal relationship with Jesus where I can actually share Mm -hmm. what it means to me Mm -hmm. to be an Adventist. So Mm -hmm. when we talk about the whole gospel, we can't just shove, you know, Daniel revelation down people's throats and say, this is what it means to be an Adventist, Mm -hmm. all of these things, but we don't talk about grace or love or mercy. Um, We want to help young people develop a more robust understanding Mm -hmm. of the gospel Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know one that integrates faith into every aspect of your life when you're working at mcdonald's what does it mean to Mm -hmm. have faith in jesus what does it mean when one of your friends you know dies by suicide Mm -hmm. we we have to give them a whole gospel picture yeah And, and and even you know as we're giving them that whole gospel picture what does it mean to study the Bible for themselves? Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times we'll give them a version of what we think of the Bible, but are we giving them the tools to be able to figure out for themselves when we're not there that they could use on other texts and as they continue their journey with God? And so being able to find God, because this is the thing, God does a much better job than we can. Yes. Right. He he. When we look at how the scriptures were formed, you know, he inspired the the the, the writers of of the Bible, and they were able to write down in their own words. And I believe that God still does the same today, where He can download on us, you know, His Spirit, and and, and give us a better understanding in this generation of what He means and how that impacts uh, their lives. So. You know, not just don't do this, don't do that, but we're giving them the full picture. This is who God is. This is the whole gospel, but also be able to live it out too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this takes serious intentionality. Mm. Um, And depending on how we were raised, you know, we kind of copy what our parents did, right? And George Barna in his book, Transforming Children into Spiritual Champions, says this. Often kids receive spiritual teaching when it is convenient for parents or when on the regimented schedule every Sunday um, without a lifelong moment-to-moment process. Our job is to lead children to develop a habit of continual spiritual growth through prayer, Bible study, service, various spiritual disciplines so we're talking about a whole picture here Mm -hmm. we can't just say sabbath yeah and we gotta go to sabbath school you gotta listen to this sermon and then the rest of the week we don't engage jesus Mm -hmm. you know we Mm -hmm. don't call jesus upon our lives in the grocery store when we lose our keys when someone's sick yeah yeah whole gospel yeah i I think you know one of the things i just want to highlight here Mm -hmm. Um, is the idea of habits. Mm -hmm. What are the habits, spiritual habits? Are we teaching the habits? Um, Because, you know, it takes, you know, as as they're taught about what those habits are, then they'll continually do those habits. We hope. We hope. We hope. Yeah. Absolutely. The third thing is parent partnerships. Mm. Now, the research shows that parents are the number one influencers when it comes to spirituality in young people. Yeah. Even teenagers. We have two teenagers. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I think it's getting harder yes. as each year goes by with our young kids. Um, and we were doing this workshop um, a couple of years ago and a gentleman came up to me after and said, you know, I don't talk to my son anymore. Like we don't have a relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, And then when I was just talking to him, why? And he said, we couldn't agree on the things that he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of parents find themselves in that situation where maybe their, their young people and the lives are not making the best choices and they're, they ask their children to leave or they Mm -hmm. get kicked out. But I'd like us to consider something that, Dr. Timothy Johansson and Michael Anderson said, Mm -hmm. he says this. Relationships is more important than behavior. Relationship Mm. is more important than behavior. Um, And the reason why is because if we have relationship, we still have influence. Mm. If we do kick out our kids, we have no more contact with them. Mm -hmm. 
we have no opportunity to say, hey, you know, let's pray together or I'm praying yeah. for you. We have no opportunity to ask them how their day went. We have no opportunity to say, you know, what are you doing with your friends? Yeah. We have no, no opportunity to tell them that we love mm -hmm. them. And I know that this is a touchy subject for individuals because yeah. a lot of people believe that if I let my children live at home, that means I support what they're doing. Mm -hmm. This is not always the case. Yeah. I mean, yes, if they're going out and, you know, doing uh, illegal things, harmful, harmful to themselves, mm -hmm. harmful to other people, we definitely need to put boundaries there. Mm -hmm. But relationship is so important because it means we still are connected with them. We sure. still have the ability mm. to pour into their lives. Yeah, yeah. We, we still have uh, leverage to yeah. influence mm -hmm. for, for us to be still part of their life even though they may not be doing what we're doing. But again, as we look at this quote, relationship more is more important than behavior. You know, we got to ask the question, well, does this, is this true with God? Is this the way that God deals with us? Yeah. And if we look at the way, this is a principle of God, that relationship is much more important than behavior. Why? How do we know that? Because he still loves us, even while we were still sinners, the Bible says, Christ died for the ungodly, even though we were doing the messed up things, the Bible still says that he already died for us and he wants to save us. And so, yes, we have, uh, you know, a, uh, 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 someone who shows us what that looks like. And, you know, if we all look back in our lives, we've all done some messed up things, right? Um, we've all done some things that we're not proud of. But hey, God never kicked us out. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still consequences. There's still consequences. Yes. <laughs> he never kicked us out. But in his great love and his mercy, he still loves us. Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we've come to love. Relationship to him is more important than behavior. Um, let's take a look at what the Bible says in Psalm 48, 78. Mm. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from the past, stories we have heard uh, and known, stories from our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. Yes, these are the parent partnerships. These are... Yeah. Yeah, you telling yeah. your kids, your nephews, your grandkids about what God has done in your life. And you pass down those faith stories. Mm. You pass down maybe the choices that yeah. you didn't make do the best sure. at, but the Lord still loved you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is how we grow that sticky <laughs> faith. Yeah. And we're not telling you as parents to tell all your stories, but you know, there are some stories that you can share with your kids that God has brought you from a mighty long way. Um, some of, you know, our kids look at us and they say, oh, wow, you're pastors. Well, we're not, we haven't been this way, you know, uh, uh, all the time. No, we made, you know, we've made some messed challenging, up messed up choices and challenging, you know, decisions in our lives. But being able to share those with them and let them know, yeah, we made mistakes. Yes, we're human. Actually, the things that we always uh, talk to you guys about, guess what? We're talking to you because we went through those things and we got burnt. We got hurt. We want to share those things. But God has led us through. And even when we look within the Old Testament, what do we see every time um, when Israel crossed uh, 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 the Red Sea, when they, they, when they crossed over to uh, the Jordan. And what did they do? They always built memorials. Mm -hmm. They always built things because those memorials, they would always say, our children are going to ask us, uh, us the question, what do these stones mean? And we can share the story of how our lives were all almost taken away from us of our history being exterminated, but yet God came through to be able to lead us into this point, into this place. So the other thing about parent partnerships is um, something that we call the stages of parenting. Yes, and Andy Stanley um, speaks on this. 
Uh, he calls age one to five the discipline years. Those are the, don't touch that. Don't touch, it's hot, but they touch it anyway, right? So it's very concrete. It's very, don't do this, don't do that. Then you get to the age of five to 12 when they're able to know things that you said not to do. Now you're kind of showing them and telling them the why behind mm -hmm. it. You know, it's so it's the training years. It's now gone uh, uh, beyond the don't do this, don't do that. But now you're teaching them, okay, this is why you don't do this, you don't do that. Uh, age 12 to 18 is probably the most hardest years. Um, and yes, we are talking about those teenage years because what he says, we've already taught them what is right and what is wrong. We've already taught them why those things are right and wrong. Now, we have to step back as coaches and be able to coach them through those years. What does that mean? Well, it means sometimes we got to allow them to make those mistakes. This is so hard. Yeah. Because it's, it's like you just want to rescue them. Yes. And but you experience. can see where they're going and you're yeah. like, oh my goodness, that's a really bad choice. But you just have to let it be. And it's yeah. the hardest. Experience is the greatest teacher, they say right? We all learn from experience, but being able in this time and age of, uh, of 12 to 18, it doesn't mean that you let them go and just keep making mistakes. No, it's teaching moments, right? You're sharing with them, hey, was that a good decision that you made? What do you think are, are the decisions? So that when they get to the age of 18 plus, you know, they're able to make good and wise decisions. We're not there telling them what to do anymore, but they know what happens, and then you get to age 18 plus. This is called the friendship years. Uh, I know a lot of people, you know, disagreed with me when I shared with them the friendship years and that the goal of parenting is friendship. The goal of parenting is friendship. And I'll tell you why I agree with this is because at the age of 18 plus, they make their own decisions. They make the decision, you know, they're either off to university, they, make a family, they, you know, all of those things, right? Work, they have now a choice of whether to come back home and visit you or not. One of the greatest things that people have told us is their child coming back home, working and living in the city, they have their own place, but they're still knocking on your door because they still want to hang out with you as parents. Yeah. This is the greatest thing. And so, yes, discipline years, training years, coaching years, friendship years. We want them to be able to bring, uh, you know, your grandchildren, mm -hmm. you know, and visit. And you know, that doesn't happen if no. the relationship is strained. Yes. And there's a lot of strained relationships. And, and the reason for it, I'm talking to the men right now, is that a lot of times the raising of the child is with the mother, mm -hmm. right? And so when we get to the coaching years, now we're trying to say, hey, you can't do this. You got to do this. You got these are the boundaries. You got to live this way. Right. But and, and now the relationship is so strained that when you get to age 18 plus. You're it's, not talking. No, anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with you. You're not in the same space yeah. anymore. They're, you know, they're living their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so we just want to leave that out with you. You may know some young parents who have children from one to five. Encourage them. Encourage mm -hmm. them with these years, coaching years, friendship years, because yeah. that's where we want to be. It's that friendship years where they don't have to hang out with you anymore, but they do. Yeah. That's the lovely thing about it. Um, and I hope our kids oh. want to hang out with us. We'll <laughs> let you know in a couple of years. <laughs> If Gabriel still wants to be our friend, um, Dr. Karen Powell from mm. the Fuller Youth Institute, you know, she did that study with the, with the 1300 kids. Yeah. Um, one of the things she mentioned was a determining factor uh, of sticky faith was family and church warmth. Mm. Family and church warmth was more correlated with faith transmission than any wow. other relational factor wow. mm -hmm. so what does that mean it means is your house warm mm -hmm. are, are, are are people kind yeah um when they come to our churches are we talking about their clothes or mm -hmm. what they look like or are we just talking about how they are 
Mm. When they come home, are they getting in trouble for this, that, and the other yeah, thing? Yeah. Um, you know, the type of uh, language that we use, the tone of voice that we use, our body language, yeah. the words we use to how we address the choices that they make, make our homes either a safe place to be mm -hmm. or a not safe place yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and no wonder why, you know, Jesus says the words, you know, the world will know that we are his disciples when we have what? We all know when we have that love, mm -hmm. when everything in our homes, our churches is built on love. This is the currency of the kingdom. Right. It's love. This is how the world knows, hey, that we're loving, uh, that we are God's disciples. It's when we love one another, yes. treat, you know, treat each other with dignity and respect. Ellen White says in Child Guidance, mm. all important work is neglected. Um, all important work is neglected. One great reason why there is so much evil in the world today is that parents occupy their minds with other things to the exclusion of the work that is all important. Mm. The patiently and kind, the task of patiently and kindly teaching their children the way of the Lord. Patiently and kindly. Mm. You know, sometimes we grab up the kids don't talk, don't do that. And, mm. and this is church. That's their experience of Jesus is don't do that. Don't do that. You're too loud. Don't run, whatever it is. Um, so when we think about the parent relationships and the partnerships, we need to make sure, sure. we're doing our sure. parts. Sure. And, 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 and we get it. We get it. You know, with uh, pastor churches where we have children who are crying while you're trying to preach, mm. right. And being very noisy, um, we, we, we get all of that, but I think we, you know, earlier on in our uh, pastoral uh, journey, um, it didn't bother us. Well, I think the reason why, uh, for our experience, our youngest son lives with autism mm. and pastoring a church and having like a two-year-old on the autistic, autism spectrum. Yeah. It was like trial by fire, you know, you're up there and then your child's right beside you mm -hmm. or they're screaming or they don't want to sit with anyone except for you. And you just, I think that I would rather have rowdy kids in my church making noise mm -hmm. instead of a church that's silent and yeah. there's no kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a gift to yeah. hear voices yes you might not like the voices but it is truly a gift mm -hmm. and for the parents that bring their child knowing that the child may be disruptive mm -hmm. and those sorts of things i mean you know we're talking about relationships and sometimes they will feel embarrassed yes. you know and most times they may not come home especially kids you know parents who have special needs kids, yes. if they're choosing between coming to church and not coming to church, they would rather choose not coming to church because it's just not worth it. it's, sometimes it's not worth it to them. So how you create, um, you know, the culture within your church, um, you know, especially for parents uh, with young kids and also kids with special needs. Absolutely. Uh, the last thing that we can do to disciple our kids is, you know, Make it make our homes and our churches a safe place to doubt. Mm. Doubt is not toxic to faith. Mm. Um, silence is toxic to faith. Mm. And you know, young people want conversations yeah. more than oh, this is what it is. That's mm. it. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, we we might not have the answers to everything, but we can talk about it. You know, they need safe places to be able to wrestle and explore and you know, they have these questions in their mind, but they need a space to do that uh, for themselves as they choose their relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't get upset. I mean, I remember being um, in high school and I, I forgot what class it was. And we asked the teacher, mm. you know, how can we do that? And we got in trouble. Yeah. Because why, why would you ask that? Mm. Like, don't you have faith in God? And the fact that we couldn't ask that question, I mean, it doesn't grow and foster me wanting to, to be in a relationship with Jesus if I can't yeah. even ask the question. Mm. So friends, what can we do today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like right now, yeah. um, as grandparents, as elders, as parents, mm -hmm. um, one of the things we can do is just set the temperature to yeah. warm. Yeah. 
warm. Can we be kind to people who come in our churches, mm -hmm. to our homes, uh, when they interact with us? Yeah. Set the temperature of mm -hmm. your home mm -hmm. to warm. Yeah, yeah. Listen more, talk less, right? Um, this is a hard one. This It's a hard one. Because we want to give advice. We want to give advice and we're listening so that we can respond. Yes. But sometimes we just need to Don't listen. Say anything. Sometimes we just need to listen and just be there. And for them to, you know, younger ones to feel that they have been heard mm -hmm. and not heard for a response, but just heard, yeah. you know, and understood. And, you know, we, we talk about empathy and yeah. uh, just being in that space with them. Yes. Um, pick one thing to work on. Mm. So maybe you are a family, you know if there's one thing you want to do, don't try to do everything. Yeah. It'll just be so overwhelming, but maybe you choose to at least eat dinner together twice mm -hmm. a week. Sure. You sure. Try that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's having family journaling time. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of people that do that. I don't know one family that does it. And I guess they, it all works for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried it for a little while when mm -hmm. the kids were younger. Um, and that was cool. We used to do it in the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do that as a family anymore. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, listen to audio Bible lullabies mm -hmm. at nighttime or conversation starters at dinner time. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Talk about three things that you're grateful for every day or mm. go to the Bible, go to have a Bible study at the cafe. Yeah. Maybe every Thursday is like donuts in the Bible. I don't know. <laughs> Just pick one thing to do. Um the, the, the last thought is, yeah. is make worship church enjoyable um, and present a relationship with Jesus in a positive manner. Yes. Um, let them see the beauty of God. Mm -hmm. Let them see the beauty of following Christ. Uh, let them see the beauty of the Sabbath. The joy. The joy of the Sabbath and, and, and what the Sabbath means. A lot of times it's, you know, sundown to sundown is the most uh, it's lame. Uh, it's it's for them. So they just need to get through this next twenty four hours. But let's talk about the Jesus of the Sabbath. What actually does it mean? It means that Jesus wants to take the burden from us. You know, He wants to give us that rest that we see. You know, of what Sabbath is is all about. Um, when we were when Orlando was pastoring Emmanuel, mm. you know, Pastor Rui and Nancy were there, and I remember she taught us. Um, she used to make Sabbath boxes yes. for the kid, for her son. And that Sabbath box would have like the coolest toys and it would only be for Sabbath. Um, so ever since she told us that, like the kids were babies, we do um, Sabbath treats. So it's like the funnest treat ever just for Sabbath. Um, and it's been something that we've done ever since. Yes. yes yeah. Because yes. we don't do a lot of like sugary stuff during the week. Mm. But on Sabbath, oh my goodness. Yeah, it's yeah. treats galore. Yeah. yeah, it's not a free fall though. It really is. Guys. <laughs> it's a free fall. <laughs> um, so as the stats and the research has shown, mm -hmm. and you've seen in your own experience, you yes. know, we're losing generations of young people. Mm. And as our kids grow they begin to make choices yeah. about their relationship with Jesus and we hope that these you know simple things can shift our thinking mm. um that the warmth of God's love can be really obvious to mm. our young people yeah. and that we will allow them to doubt and ask questions mm. as we intentionally grow with them mm. so I'm just going to share some websites resources with you great great things. Fuller Youth Institute has just a ton of things for parents as well. Mm -hmm. um, lots of great things there. Uh, and the other thing, I don't know if there's any young, young families here, but Defend Young Minds yes. is a really good website to, for parents to learn how to protect their kids from pornography mm. because it's everywhere. We don't, we don't have to look for it. It's just there. Um, great website. Um, the other one is Connect Ontario, which is the website that we use mm -hmm. for family, singles, men and women. Yeah. And there are great resources on there um, that you can tap into. The rest, I don't know if you want to take a snapshot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, two other websites is Gorgeous to God mm. and A Rugged Journey. Mm. These two have come out from the North American Division for young men and women. Yeah. They can ask any question they want anonymously. And a mentor will 
prayerfully mm -hmm. respond. Mm -hmm. And if you just take a look at some of the questions that have come in from, from young people, you know, in our churches, in our community, like they're going through a lot of things. Yeah. And so uh, we'll also put our um, email in the chat there if you have any questions. Um, and we just want to thank you for the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, we don't want to keep. Questions. We don't want to keep everyone long. It is a Friday night. Um, Sabbath worship is tomorrow. But hey, if you have a question, please go ahead, raise your hand. Um, even if you have a comment or you just want to highlight something that we did uh, uh, speak of here today, please just go ahead, raise your hand. We will acknowledge you. And uh, Gibson, we're going to give you um, uh, the opportunity. Unmute yourself and let us know. Yes, uh, good stuff, good stuff. Um, I think I, I believe um, what in what George Banner just said. There's a clip that you just brought about George Banner. Yes. Where he's talking about uh, parents' role in um, teaching their children, you know, uh, in fellowship, Bible study, and so forth. I think as parents, we are failing in this regard because the traditional home, right, in, a, in an Adventist home is just to call kids, oh, let's have prayer, read the scripture, and you pray, right, maybe every day. But what are we doing to equip these children in terms of uh, doctrines or the Bible so that when they go out there, they are solid, right? We, we, we are lacking in that regard. That's, that is why when they go out there, they get absorbed in that culture and because they have, they have no ground to stand on, right? Mm. They're gone. So yeah. I think George Banner hit it on the nail. I like that um, even Ellen White also, the clip that you brought about Ellen White is, is saying the same thing too. And then the other thing I was gonna ask is that um, uh, when we come from other countries, we come to these first world countries, right? Children are from different cultures. They come here, they get absorbed into this new culture. <laughs> How do we rescue them or what can we do so that they are not absorbed into this new culture? <laughs> mm -hmm. a it's, it's, it's a big problem, it's a big problem. That's a good question. And I think um, I would continue to share Jesus with love. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to love our young people more than we do now. Mm. Uh, they already know all the things they're not supposed to do because they've heard it their whole lives. Yeah. Right. And so now they come to, you know, North America, they come to Canada and they've got opportunities to do all kinds mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what if mom and dad and you know aunties and uncles are always the safe place to land mm. so if they make those garbage choices yeah they always know oh, man i'm so glad my parents love me because mm -hmm. look at our relationship with jesus mm -hmm. you know me we make whack choices sometimes but God is never going to say, oh, man, get out of here. Mm -hmm. You're too far mm -hmm. gone. He always says, come back. There are yeah. consequences, but he always allows us to come back. And I would say to continue to share Jesus mm -hmm. in a, with abundant love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you know, and, and as Liz, Liz uh, shares that, um, we, we just got to be reminded that God transcends culture. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so as we learn about God, it's not about trying to keep them in a, 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 a type of understanding of God. It's how how do they take God and then live God out in this culture that they are in, especially if, like you said, we are coming in from a different culture, but God is here in this culture, too. Mm -hmm. And so the more we learn about him, the more we understand, OK, this is how God shows up in this culture. How do I find my footing in this culture so that I will glorify God? Because and that's difficult. Because because they're here. This is this is the reality mm -hmm. of their new reality, especially depending on what age they you know our kids come in here. Canada is the new reality, or the, mm -hmm. the U.S. is the new reality, and so we always need to go back into the fundamentals, mm -hmm. go back into the foundation. So that no matter what situation that they're in, they will always have God as the foundation of their life. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Beulah, you got your hand up. Yes, I do. Thank you. I know what the situation 
where there's a single mother with a daughter mm -hmm. and the daughter feels entitled you know like um you are my mother you have to provide this you have to provide that but there is she expects this of the mother but she does not reciprocate how do you um encourage that parent that single parent because you're saying that we have to show love the mother is saying mm -hmm. the mother is doing all she can the mother is trying to update herself so that they are better she's in a better position to mm -hmm. help the child. but the child seems to think that whatever she thinks that she has to do she will do right and has to acquiesce to whatever she says mm -hmm. so how do you help somebody with that uh, can I ask how old the daughter is? She is 17 at the moment. Okay. I think um, boundaries are really important. Um, you know, being straight with our kids, you know, this is the budget. This is what we have. If you want something outside of this budget, that is going to be your responsibility. Not because I don't love you, but because we have a family budget. Mm -hmm. um, and the daughter's not going to be like, oh, okay, mom, sure, no problem. No, the daughter's going to get upset. Yeah. But if yeah. the mother stands firm in love, mm -hmm. you just can't give it. And, the, you know, the daughter might have a temper tantrum, mm -hmm. especially if there has been a history of that kind of spoiled child syndrome type of thing. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while to break those habits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think standing firm in boundaries, which is, like I said, it's going to be very, very difficult. difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I would also suggest that the mom seek professional counseling mm -hmm. just for herself to learn uh, of those like really practical tools on how to manage adolescent parenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's helpful, Beulah, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but if you... Uh, we also have a counseling initiative, mm -hmm. which has a whole listing of therapists that uh, we can share with you if they want access to that. Uh, we also have a financial subsidy if maybe, you know, we don't have the health insurance to pay for it, what yeah. have you. Um, but giving parents access to that families and, and couples allows us to really get the tools that we need mm -hmm. to, you know, manage this yeah. parenting, especially yeah, yeah. with kids who, you know, are a little bit difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, totally, uh, you know, as you speak about um, um, single parenting, uh, very difficult, mm -hmm. you know, very difficult. Um, but I believe that this is where our community comes in. This is where you know, sometimes the, the five church, to one ratio. The five to one ratio. That's that's why it is important, you know, to have um, uh, different spaces um, to pour into the child. So it's not always on the single mother. Uh, everything is burdened on her. But the same message, the messaging that has been uh, portrayed at home, is the same messaging that she also gets in a sports um, in a sports club. Let's say she loves basketball or whatever it is. Um, it's the same that she gets at the um, the youth group. This, you know, we all come together. We all pitch in and we all help out. This is where we're able to do that, especially for families that are uh, single, mm -hmm. um, because sometimes yes, it can feel like you're doing everything on your own, and there's really no no um, time to breathe, um, you know, in those situations. But just being able to have those five to one ratios um, and this can be done you know intergenerationally yeah. you know um, to pour into our young women and also our young men as well um could you tell me again the name of the list it's called the counseling initiative mm -hmm. uh, and i can send it to pastor or i'll put my email in the chat yeah. and you can just send me an email and i will send it i'll send it directly to, to you, you. Mm -hmm. No worries. Um, so there's another question in the chat that says, oh, uh, a lot of parents are doing their best, but sometimes we expect perfection in church. So when kids mess up, parents are made to feel ashamed. We definitely need more grace as parenting mm -hmm. is challenging no matter where we are. Yeah. You are not wrong, mm -hmm. Melissa. Yeah. It's true. Um, 
Another question is, how can parents compromise with children regarding worship being in a place of their choice if where the children prefer to worship is in a different city? Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming this is online, yeah. right? Because they're probably not traveling. Um, I would say let them worship. Mm -hmm. If they're going to a church in the U.S., um, you could always say, okay, you can go there for one service and then maybe one week you come with me mm -hmm. to this service mm -hmm. or maybe you do sabbath school over there and then together we watch this service mm -hmm. um i think what's important is they want to connect with jesus mm -hmm. and they're choosing to do it maybe in a different country mm -hmm. isn't that better than them not having a relationship with god at all mm -hmm. um i think that's a question that we need to ask well even if it's parents. in a different city so mm -hmm. even if it's in person Mm -hmm. right a different city and I remember you know the example um, of one of the pastors mm -hmm. um, in Toronto um, and pastors you know we move around a lot to different uh, churches the kids were at an age where they had built some lifelong partners friends, uh, friends in the church that they were currently at and now the conference has asked them to move to a different location um understanding just how critical it was in their that part of their life to have consistency and to have deep meaningful relationships they moved to the different church as per request of the conference the pastor but they left their kids and they were like teens right mm -hmm. teens high schoolers you know at that age they left their kids at the church that they were pastoring before they knew that it was so important for their faith to develop in that place then to rip them up and to do it all over again to find different friends knowing that university was coming just in a in 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 a in a few, um, years. In a few years so they were going to be off anyways uh, and so you know just as you're as you're looking at a, you know ask the question you know what is um is is what is beneficial for them at this age that they are in is it to connect with their friends in a certain church, knowing that that church is caring for them and pouring into them, um, then for them to be, you know, like all together, all together, you know, in it, you know, every every home is different, every family is different. Um, there's no one blueprint for all of that, um, but the bottom line is that they do get the care spiritually and they do feel connected with the people that are part of that church. Yes. I don't know if there are any other questions. Sister Ella, uh, I just saw you unmute your mic, so I wasn't sure if you had uh, a, a question uh, to ask, but please, um, you know, we're not gonna keep everyone too long. Uh, we have a awesome church service tomorrow uh, that we're inviting you all to as well. Uh, and so if you do have a question, let us know um, if you want to just say a few words as to uh, how this has impacted you, um, please go ahead and do that. But uh, we have been blessed by the opportunity to be able to share with each of you. We look forward to tomorrow and some of the discussions that we will continue. Uh, I know that we are going to be at uh, uh, Niagara tomorrow morning and also speaking at St. Catherine's uh, for midday service. And then the afternoon, we will be at St. Catherine's. So we're looking forward to seeing all of you. Yes. Um, if no other questions, God bless you. Uh, Pastor, we're gonna hand it back over to you. All right, thank you. Wow. Great, great, um, uh, great in, in information. And um, I hope that, uh, and if you've missed anything, of course, um, it's being recorded and you can always go back and revisit the uh, information, revisit the, the video and, um, and get uh, what you need, what you missed from there. So as Pastor Pule said, tomorrow morning uh, at 9.30, uh, we'll be on the falls there and then shift over here to St. Catharines um, at 11 o'clock. Um, now, Pastor, uh, you're okay. You have directions to get there for that time. You guys are okay? 
Yeah, I, I think we bumped into, I like many years ago, we love coming to Niagara. We've always done it. Um, you know, we almost did it like every year. And one year we actually bumped into the Adventist church. So, um, but maybe if you want to just send us the address, just in case, just in case. We'll love that. <laughs> okay, I, I can do that. I Thank can you. Do that. Okay. And um, as a reminder, for those of you from Niagara Falls, um, you will not have the ability, uh, in case if you're not going to church in person, you'll not be able to see it on the, on the live stream there at Niagara Falls because uh, the AV team, um, you know, it's a coincidence that all the AV team is away. And so um, I actually will be manning the AV there tomorrow uh, while uh, Elizabeth and uh, Orlando is there. Uh, and then we'll quickly come back here for 11 o'clock. Um, but, uh, and so that, uh, so you, if you want to, you can either wait for the video to be posted on the YouTube channel of either church, or you can uh, live stream at 11 o'clock um, during the Sabbath school at Niagara Falls um, over here at St. Catherine's and then see that live, or you can watch later. Remember also that in the afternoon, uh, starting at three o'clock, there will be two more presentations. One, the first one is relationship maintenance, that is uh, general to all relationships. And then session two, the effects of social media and the family. So you'll have those two available and we'll use the same Zoom information as tonight. Okay, um, any question that anybody would like to ask? Um, any other information that you may need? Um, there's something on the chat there. Let me see if it's a question. Uh, no. Okay. All right. So we're good to go. All right. Very good. Thank you so much for participating. And um, I bid you good night and may God bless you. And we'll see you again tomorrow morning. And uh, let's have a word of prayer as we close tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your loving care. We thank you for being with us tonight. And uh, may the Holy Spirit uh, continue with us in our hearts. And may we have a restful uh, night uh, so we can enjoy, continue enjoying the Sabbath activities in the morning. We pray for each one of uh, here present uh, as well for the presenters. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, have a good night. Thank you for night. everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.